Welcome to a new decade of Visual Studio, where we're going to tell you everything we've been working on for C++20, our open standard library implementation, and more. My name is Sai Brand, and I'm Microsoft's C++ developer advocate. I am Mario Luparo, and I'm the program manager lead for the C++ team. Before we get started, we have a lot going on um, at CBPCon for Microsoft right now. Uh, we have our own exhibitor hall, well, our own booth in the exhibitor hall and our own exhibitor room. So if you have any questions about any of the announcements we're making either today or any of the other days, or even just questions about our tooling, if you want to hear um, what we're working on, if you want to ask us about issues you're having, get some help, then please come and talk to us. We'd love to have all your feedback. We also, like every year, have our survey. Um, we like to gather as much information to make our tools as helpful for you folks as possible. Uh, this year, we have five copies of Microsoft Flight Simulator to give out. We're going to be giving out one every day. So if you sign up to do the survey, then you might win something, which is always fun. And speaking of helping people, this is our mission of the C++ product team at Microsoft. It's to make the lives of all C++ developers on the planet better. That's whether you're using our tools or not. And there's five main ways we do this. One is by participating in the standards. And that's not just driving our own proposals and submitting designs. It's also helping to validate designs, helping to do experimental implementations of new papers to really drive forward the standards efforts. Then there's our own tooling, which we work on, our compiler and standard library, our um, VC package, which is a solution for library acquisition, our Visual Studio IDE, and the C++ extension for Visual Studio Code. Now, we're going to focus on those middle three for this talk, MSVC, VC package, and the IDE. If you'd like to hear about Visual Studio Code, which, if you're not familiar, is an open source, well, a code editor built upon open source, which runs cross-platform Windows, Mac, Linux, and has what you would expect from a C++ developer environment. We have a talk um, right after this in the same room by Julia, who's going to tell you everything you want to know. But enough about VS Code for now. We're going to move on to the meat of our talk. So we have four things on our agenda today. One is all the work we've been doing in conformance for C++ and C. There's been you know, huge swaths of new papers, lots of new features in C++20. It's a massive update. So we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of work that has been done. So we're going to share that with you. Next, we're going to move on to code safety, where we'll talk about what we're doing to help make your code secure. Static analysis, tools to help you find issues before they happen in production. Next, we move on to cross-platform development. Visual Studio is not just an IDE for targeting Windows. It's much more than that now. We're really focusing on our cross-platform development story, and we have more to share on that. And then finally, we'll finish off with developer and team productivity, all the things we've been adding and changing to make your lives easier as developers, both as individuals and as a team. So the first thing to state is that available this week is Visual Studio 2019 version 16.8 preview three, which is quite long and wordy, but essentially this is our next big update. You know, preview three is where we have the majority of all of our features, and this is gonna give you an idea of what to expect for, from 16.8 uh, when it releases. So you can now download this from um, visualstudio.microsoft.com slash vs slash preview. Now, moving on to our first agenda item, which is conformance. Our first big announcement for this year is that as of version 16.8, Visual Studio 2019 achieves C17 standards conformance. This is something which people have been asking for for a while, and we've now really nailed down. This is all C11 and C17 required features. Uh, note that's not the, the features in C99, which were made optional in C11. Uh, we do have some of those on the roadmap. Um, threads and atomics are, um, we do have planned. If there are any other optional features you would really like 
to see in our tools and have strong use cases for, please let us know. Either just come talk to us at the booth, make tickets on developer community, upvote tickets. We'd love to hear from you. If you do want to try this out, it does require a preview release of Windows SDK because it involves uh, changes to the, the universal C runtime. So please go ahead and try that out. Next, our main focus on conformance has been C++ 20. This is our state last year. You know, we had feature complete for concepts. We were most of the way there on things like coroutines, modules, uh, spaceship operator, a bunch of the smaller C++ 20 features, but still not quite there. As of now, we can announce that C++ 20 modules are now feature complete. So this includes the header units changes, and it also includes um, some experimental tooling. So if you're using MS build, um, it will actually look at the dependencies between your modules and make sure they're built in the right order. And that's not just within a project. If you have, for example, a static library, which um, some ex executable has a dependency on, then the build system will still work out all the dependencies between your modules and get them built. This is available under the std slash C++ latest switch. And we'll have a blog post live on that URL, aka.ms slash cpp20 modules, where you can look for all of the details. Our next feature is C++20 coroutines, which are also feature complete. So we've had support for a while for the, the coroutines TS. This update includes everything which made it into C++20 coroutines themselves. So uh, we do still have support for the old style. So if you have code which requires the, the coroutines TS style, you can still use that using the slash await switch and the experimental coroutines header. But to try out the new features, you just pass C++ latest, you use the normal coroutines header, and you'll get everything. The support also includes some coroutines tooling. So you can actually debug your coroutines and you know, put a breakpoint within a coroutine, and you can hit it where you expect. You'll be able to see your call stack. It's uh, all a really nice experience for you know, when something goes wrong, especially because there's a lot to coroutines if you're not familiar with it. Uh, being able to see when you're hitting all those callbacks and things like that can really help. So that's our major C++ 20 um, features. We now have a, this slide gives an overview of where we're at. So as I said, feature complete for coroutines, modules, concepts, spaceship operator, and a bunch of the standard library features, currently 84. Uh, we are doing a lot of work to finish off our C++20 support, which includes all of the const expert changes, which were made to the language, and the last of the STL features. So when all of these are shipping, we'll have a slash std C++20 switch, and that will be when we're saying, right, we're feature complete. You can now go and um, assume that we, we have all the support for all of the features. Uh, note that uh, this, the C++17 support used to have a little asterisk next to it because our conformant preprocessor work was still experimental. That's no longer the case as of a few months ago. We have now a fully conformant preprocessor, um, so it can claim full C++17 support. So moving on to um, some of the STL features. Last year, we announced um, in this session from last year that our standard library was open, going to be open source. So now you can find it on GitHub, uh, github.com slash Microsoft slash STL. And all of our work is right there. Uh, as of today, we have 84 C++ 20 features completed. And we're really, really happy that 36 of those were contributed by people outside of Microsoft. So this really validates our, our move to make this open source. And we're really, really pleased that with the high quality of all of the patches we've got and the fact that all of the community are coming together to help make this a great library. So thank you so much for that. Please keep on submitting all of your patches. As you can see from this graph, you know, the C++ 20 features kept on getting added to the standard, and we're slowly being chipping away at them, and we're now down to 24 left. So if you'd like to um, hear more about the STL in particular, uh, Stefan, our very own STL, has a session tomorrow, which you can go check out. 
Um, in particular, in the STL, ranges are a huge um, part of C++20. And we're almost there. We're about 95% complete. And we, we've been adding a lot of these in parts. So uh, Preview 3, which is our new update, ships with a lot of new things, a lot of, especially a lot of new algorithms, some more views, factories. And coming next, we just need to finish off those last bits. And those are going to be coming every update. So we're not going to be like waiting for the big updates. These are trickling out as they're implemented. And if you'd like to know more about those, then uh, Casey Carter has a blog post which is going to go out and we'll tell you all about it. You can also track all of this on our STL repo on GitHub. There's a roadmap which tells you, you know, when you can expect things to come, what's still to do, what we've done. I'm trying to be like very open and transparent about everything and to keep it easy to track for you guys. So uh, please go and check that out. And with that, I will pass over to Marion, who's going to demo some of our new features. In this demo, I want to show you how we're making progress on supporting modules, core routines, and concepts inside the IDE. As with any features in Visual Studio, this new C++ 20 features are, uh, that are just announced wouldn't be complete without the support in the editor, build time, and in the debugger. Uh, for this demo, we'll use a fairly simple code base, and it's really comprised of a generator, a printer, and a formatter that prints out a Fibonacci sequence. Um, and we'll start with the generator, uh, because this one is implemented uh, using coroutines, and the return type of the function is fib, which is a coroutine. And what this function does is that it loops, um, um, and it keeps yielding one integer at a time from the Fibonacci series. Now, coming back to main, we'll just print the sequence using the formatter. So let's, uh, let's see this in action. I'll set a breakpoint here, and uh, let me bring this file side by side here so that we can see the execution goes in parallel, and we'll start the debugger. So let's see how debugging a coroutines look like. If I step into the code, it'll jump inside the fibgen uh, function, and as you would expect with any function, execution will continue in it. Um, what will happen, though, is when the core yield is reached, the coroutine will be suspended and the execution will return back to the caller. So now let's go and, uh, and print uh, this. Uh, so we'll just uh, step into and we'll step into the format. And the format is pretty simple. It asks the coroutine um, if it's done yet. Uh, if it's not done, uh, it asks uh, for the next value and it continues looping in. And uh, now it that's what would you expect, but what if I want to investigate how the next integer will get computed? Well, with Visual Studio 2019, now you can do that just by stepping into the code core routine. Uh, that is made possible by just my code feature being enabled inside of Visual Studio. And what I told just my code is that to treat the underlying core routine implementation as non-user code. So I can just step into and um, I can resume execution exactly at the point that this core routine was suspended before. Now, I can debug and I can uh, see how the values are computed. And when a new core yield is found, uh, the execution goes back um, to the caller. And we can do this again. Um, and I can click step into. Um, and the execution will jump directly to the coil they were left off. Now, a quick tip. Um, if you hover over the locals, uh, you're going to see their values. But as you can see from the call stack, the parameters for the uh, coroutines are not listed. So uh, you won't be able to see their value directly. If you expand the core of frame putter, though, that's where the, the parameters are visible. And at a moment in time, eventually this will show up in auto and watch window as well. But until then, this is a good tip to be aware of. So let's hit a 5 and let's see the whole program output running. Now, there is something else I want to show you uh, that VS does for coroutines, and that is the static analysis support. Static analysis is trying to catch some common pitfalls that may affect your code when using coroutines. Uh, in this example, if I hover over, uh, you can see the message says lifetime of the memory referenced by parameter len might end uh, by the time the coroutine is resumed. And if you look at the parameter, uh, it is passed by reference, um, and it is entirely possible that if you pass it, let's say, as a, st a stack object to this coroutine, the stack will exist during the first call. Uh, but after the coroutine gets resumed, that call stack may be long gone because the, the, the coroutine is going to execute. Another way you can try, another problem, you could be with mutexes. And let me really quick uh, um, take advantage of this light bulb 
to include the header. And then here I can do m dot. And you can see IntelliSense recommending what are some of the popular methods used uh, in this context for mutexes. And small parenthesis here uh, to tell you that this functionality is called IntelliCode. And uh, it makes recommendations based on patterns that are gleaned from large code bases uh, that we train it with. But you can also train it on your own types. So you can get recommendation on those types if you wanted to. Uh, so now closing the parentheses, if I do mlock here and I save the, the file, uh, when I hover over the code yield, I, I should see two warnings. And uh, this new one is going to say uh, suspending a coroutine while holding lock m is something that I, I should be aware of. So let's fix this. But before I do, let me show you how I enable these rules. If I go to project properties, go to code analysis under Microsoft, there is a long list of rules you can enable. Um, I am using the core concurrency rules here, being very specific about what I pick. But you can also pick Microsoft all rules. That includes uh, this and a lot more. So let's clean up this code uh, because we want to make sure that uh, we, we use it for other purposes as well. And we'll go into the uh, module definition and fix the declaration there too. So now we should be good. So we are inside a module now. And this is the next thing that I want to dive into. As you can see, uh, in Solution Explorer, here's the structure of our program. We have one program or one project that defines two modules. The printer project defines another module. And then we have the executable that brings it all together. And all of this is now uh, a very natural thing to do in Visual Studio. As you can uh, see, uh, you are not limited to a single module per project or any limitations like that. The code navigation will work as expected. So if I navigate between the results, I can find the different module definitions and imports. And now, if I go back to our main function, um, let's add a new module to a project. Um, because I'm not very happy with how the default printer prints out the series. Um, it's pretty simple, as you can see the implementation. And what I want to do is uh, define a new way of, of printing this. So I'll just right click here, do uh, add, and we have a new entry uh, in this menu called module. And this is, will add a new module to my project. I just type in the name, let's see, better printer. And the new module definition will, uh, will get created. And I'll just uh, drag it here side by side so we can see both. Because um, I'll create a class with the same methods as the, the basic printer that we're using. But instead of C out, I want to use uh, FMT. Um, to bring in FMT, I can just do a pound include of the header FMT. Let's use color.h. Um, and FMT is already uh, pre installed. I configured it via VC package. Um, so now let's uh, create a new struct, and I'll name it printer, and I'll uh, choose to export it. And copy and pasting the definition, we'll just replace it, the C out usage with FMT. And uh, inside the, here, we'll just say FMT print. Um, let's see. And let's go a bit, uh, a bit crazy with colors. Uh, let's just uh, do foreground. Uh, let's pick a color. Maybe add some background to. Oh no, let, let, let's just do bold and the, leave it there. And uh, what we'll print, we'll print the value um, and maybe let's say between squares, brackets. Uh, for the separator, similarly, uh, we can, uh, let's try to pick another color for background and uh, just pass in the comma. We can just leave this uh, one uh, as it was before at the, the print uh, end of line. Um, but I'll, I'll need to, to pound include the IO stream for now. So now I have a module. And something I want to show you is that when I rebuild this project, um, the, the uh, Visual Studio will figure out the order uh, in which uh, these two modules in my project uh, are, should be building. Oh, I forgot a semicolon. Um, of course I did. Let me fix that. Um, so again, as I was saying, we'll Visual Studio will figure out the order in which these two modules should be building. As a user, I don't have to do anything. Um, now, for the next step, um, you can see that uh, printer is already a project reference uh, to my main project. And this means that all I have to do to consume this module is just do an import in my CPP file uh, that is part of this, uh, of this project. And I'll just replace here with uh, the default printer with the new type. And that should be all I need to do uh, to consume this. So let's just uh, build it. 
And if everything goes well, it should uh, build and now I can run it and see the new printer in action. Look at those colors. Now that's pretty nice. Um, so as you can see, I did not have to do anything special. I just started adding modules to my project and VS took care of making sure it all works. I used project to project references to consume uh, the modules from other projects and they were immediately visible. If I go to the definition for printer, um, it will take me to the correct definition, which is uh, defined inside the module. It all works as expected. All right, so we talked about the generator and the printer. Now, uh, let's take a look at the formatter. And the reason why I want to talk about the formatter is because uh, it uses concepts. And concepts have been supported in the compiler for a while now. But what I um, want to show you today is the IntelliSense support. So instead of type name, you can see here that a series is actually a concept. And I can immediately go to definition. Um, and of course, concepts are now a first class citizen of the code navigation and IntelliSense experiences in VS. You can see the contract, it has a print element, a print separator, and a print IOLA uh, end of line, and that's what this concept defines. This is what a printer looks like. Um, but what I want to do now is define a new formatter um, that uses the same concepts as template parameters. And I wonder if uh, IntelliSense can, uh, can help me out here. I'm just going to re-implement this method and uh, just, uh, just do it better. Uh, what we'll do is uh, first check if, uh, if it's not done and print the first element and only print separators between the elements. That's the improvement I want to make to this function. Um, but watch what happens when I start uh, typing code inside this function now. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's first um, uh, check uh, that uh, S is not done. So uh, if S is not done, then uh, we'll uh, we'll check for uh, for t. That's done. Then we'll just uh, we'll, we'll just print the element. So print element of s. Next and uh, Intel just let me pause right now just to let it sink in what's going on. IntelliSense is able to parse inside the concepts definition. Uh, that I was showing you earlier. Let me bring it back up on the screen and identify what parts of this contract can be offered as IntelliSense memberless results. You can see that uh, these are coming from the concept definition. Um, and um, even if uh, template IntelliSense does not provide any sample arguments for my template, I'm still able to get IntelliSense via concept. Isn't that cool? Now, uh, let's, uh, let's finish this function, so while as done. And we'll have IntelliSense help us along the way, not only typing much faster, but even making sure that what I type is something that it's correct. Um, this uh, would have liked it take uh, a lot longer for us to type this in. I need to add the, the end of line, and that's it. And that's all I had to do to create a better formatter. Um, so now let's, uh, let's use it and uh, set it here as a parameter uh, in the print call and control F5. Let's see the output, and there you go. There is no uh, extra comma at the end. Uh, and indeed, this is a better formatter. And we did all that with the help of a better IntelliSense. Now, of course, um, I can still use uh, template IntelliSense and specify some uh, sample arguments. Uh, but if I look for instantiations, um, IntelliSense will not be able to find any of them uh, because the only usage is inside another template. Um, well, let me share a quick trick of how you can get this to work as well. Uh, you can go here uh, to this uh, uh, function where the, our format is called and search for template instantiations here. This one is going to have some templates because it's called directly from main. Um, and um, if you select one of them, I'll select this one. Uh, now, IntelliSense sees this as an instantiation of the format function. Um, so you can go back here and search again for instantiations. Uh, and as it finishes, you can see the result popping up. And now you can select it. And now you can get even more detailed IntelliSense for your types. All right. So that's the demo I wanted to show you. Uh, you've seen the new capabilities uh, in the IDE for coroutines, modules, concepts. We believe that Visual Studio is the best place to start your C++ 20 explorations. And whether you start with modules, coroutines, concepts, or ranges, um, you're not only getting a C++ 20 toolset with Visual Studio, but a fully integrated experience that includes editing, building, and debugging, specifically attuned to your requirements of C++ 20. 
Um, this is uh, a lot of great work done by the engineering team uh, and uh, in this release. However, uh, I am aware of two fixes that didn't make it in that I was demoing in my private build, uh, didn't make it in in Preview 3 um, around IntelliSense support for modules, but they will soon be available and you can enjoy all of the, the demos, uh, features demoed here today. Switching gears from conformance uh, to code safety. Um, when we think of code safety, we think of uh, three different areas. We think of static analysis, dynamic analysis, and runtime checks. So let's start with code analysis, for which we know that you may have many options to pick from today. Um, what we want to make sure is that Visual Studio gives you access to the best options directly into your editor. Um, you've seen in my demo um, that this code analysis is not limited to the uh, build output anymore. And green squiggles and quick fixes help you as you type. Uh, in Visual Studio, you can turn the dial from something very lightweight, like our new code linters uh, that are running inside our IntelliSense engine, so they have close to no overhead, uh, to something like Clang Tidy that brings in a lot more checks and then crank the dial all the way up to a complete rule set that the MSVC code analysis provides that not only includes the Microsoft C++ core guidelines checkers, but many other checks too. Check Sunny's talk, where uh, some of these recent improvements will be showcased. And next, let's talk about dynamic analysis. Address sanitizer uh, support in MSVC has been one of the announcements uh, last year at CVPCon. Ever since, we've been busily continuing our collaboration with LLVM to enable the address sanitizer runtime on Windows and integrating address sanitizers inside Visual Studio. And I'll show you a bit more of this in the next demo. Since uh, last CVPCon, we have added support for x64 uh, and enabled a much richer debugging experience for ASAN. So if you haven't yet tried it, now it's the perfect time. And if this doesn't sound convincing enough, please let Victor try to convince you in his session on Tuesday. And one more session that I want to recommend, don't miss Justin's and Michael's talk on Friday to see what lies beyond address sanitizers in terms of dynamic analysis. And spoiler alert, it has to do with unit testing, lip fuzzer, and some magic dust. Don't miss it. When it comes to runtime checks, Visual Studio provides your code with um, a lot of runtime capabilities options already. And uh, to learn more, uh, please check out the link at the bottom for a good overview. Um, what I want to highlight today is that another recent collaboration with LLVM. If ASAN was uh, something brought from LLVM to MSVC, CFG goes the other way around. Um, and if you're not familiar with CFG, is a platform security technology that enforces control flow integrity uh, on Windows uh, via runtime checks injected by the compiler to validate indirect branch calls like jump or call and so on. MSVC has support, supported CFG for the past few releases under Guard CF. Uh, switch, but now our Microsoft security team has contributed CFG support to LLVM as well. And I'm happy to report that this support is now shipping in LLVM 10, which uh, you can install directly from our Visual Studio installer. Our next topic I'm going to talk about today is cross platform development, and we'll start with VC Package. If you're not familiar with VC Package, um, VC Package is the largest installable catalog of C++ libraries today. Many of these libraries have been contributed by the community over the past four years since we first launched VC Package as an open source project on GitHub here at CVPCon. We took another big step two years ago by moving beyond Windows to support Linux and Mac. For the past few months, we've been hard at work preparing the next natural evolution for VC Package. With many internal teams at Microsoft adopting VC package and a larger than ever C++ community using and contributing to VC package, we are ready to introduce the next wave of features that will challenge the way you and your team are handling your C++ dependencies today. What we're announcing today is a set of features that all by themselves are wonderful, but you will see their full strength when you bring them together in a cohesive experience targeted at large teams, and enterprises. Manifests allow you to specify your dependencies de declaratively in a JSON file and then check it in in source control for your whole team to take advantage of. VC package integration with CMake and MS Build has also been enhanced now, making it easier than ever to take care of your dependencies acquisition. Binary caching allows you to share binaries across machines, CI runs, and with your whole team. 
saving you lots of time compared with having to build your dependencies from source every time. Combined with manifests, binary caching can offer a magical first-time experience when you're setting up a new machine or having someone new join your team by having them up and running in minutes. Check out our blog post um, that just went live this morning um, at the link below to learn more about this announcement. But that's not all we're working on. Coming soon, you will also be able to use VC Package in your organization to acquire internal libraries or third-party libraries that are closed source, thus providing a unified acquisition channel for all of your C++ dependencies, not only for OSS dependencies. We will also update our catalog to allow you to directly select the version of a particular library you want to use. And now, we will retain our opinionated view that you should refrain from mixing and matching arbitrary versions of libraries and recommend that you continue to rely on our lab validations, which test the integration and the interactions between various libraries uh, versions every day. These high quality guarantees are things that some of you have grown to expect from VC package, and as such, our lib validation will continue unabated. But we acknowledge that sometimes you do need the flexibility that individual libraries versioning provides, and that's coming soon. So let's switch now to a demo to show you some of these capabilities and more. For this demo, we will use a CMake project, and let's just assume that I'm a new member that has just joined my team, and I'm still working on getting myself familiar with the code base. My first task will be to make sure that all of our tests are passing when built with address sanitizer. But before I start uh, doing that, let me just show you really quickly what this app does. Um, what it does, it's, it does some pre-processing of the image, and then it does some face recognition. And for the faces that it recognizes uh, that don't have a mask, it will draw a virtual face mask on them. As you can see, we do find the two faces in the picture, but we also falsely recognize a few more. But that's that's what's important. What's important is that all the tests of this application are passing. Um, so this is a great place to start for adding address sanitizer support to my code base. While I'm still trying to learn the code base, a good place to start is always Solution Explorer. For CMake projects, the default view is this view, but another view that is really useful is the CMake targets view. Some of you may be familiar with Target View as it has been in the product for a while now. Um, this is a good place to see the structure of the CMake project, the targets, the files, um, the references between targets. Um, the nice thing about it is if you double click on an item, it will take you exactly to the place where the item is being defined. Now, Something new in the latest update of Visual Studio is the ability to semantically understand CMake scripts. Now with Visual Studio, you can do things like investigate how a property is being defined. Um, so if I right click on this property um, and say find all references, this will actually scout all of the CMake scripts uh, and list all of the locations where the property is being changed. This is not limited uh, just to the properties that you define in your own script. You can search for variables defined elsewhere, like in this example uh, for uh, OpenCV include DERS. Um, this also works with targets too. Uh, so if I ask for final references for this target, I will find all of the location where this target is being modified. If I say go to definition, I'll go to the precise location where this target is defined. And just to prove that this is a semantic search um, and uh, not just text search, I'll point out that uh, this add test statement uh, defines the test with the same name as the executable target. But despite that, this line is not listed as a result uh, in the references. There are a lot more features in uh, Visual Studio that take advantage of the semantic uh, uh, knowledge now for CMake. So I recommend checking out Erica's uh, session later uh, in the week uh, to see what else VS can do now with CMake scripts. Now, to validate our tests with address analyzer, I created a new CMake configuration. And I'll show it to you in the CMake settings UI. The only difference between uh, this configuration and uh, the default one is that I introduced this new variable, uh, use sanitizer, that allows me to, in turn, inside the CMake script, when this is on, uh, to uh, configure and pass on the compiler switches correctly. So let's switch to that configuration uh, now, and you can see Solution Explorer refreshing, and we're going to wait now for uh, the results to run. This are these are tests that are built with address sanitizer. And let me tell you that running address sanitizer over a code base for the first time can be both exhilarating and 
nerve wracking. It certainly can change the way you're looking at your code, even for folks that are intimately familiar with the inner workings um, of their code base. And you can see there's already some failures. Uh, lots of tests has passed, and uh, I'll double click on, on where the failure occurs. Um, and looking at the source, there's not something very obvious with uh, the failure, but we can click on the code lens to get more information about the run. And Google test is yelling at me right now that uh, uh, this test probably crashed. And unsurprisingly, the reason of the crash is address sanitizer. It is a heap buffer overflow. Uh, so this means we're either reading or writing outside of the memory we've been allocating, uh, which can be quite a serious error. Um, let's, uh, let's debug this test. Uh, to dig deeper into the failure. Visual Studio can start debugging session just for this test. Uh, and once uh, the address sanitizer failure is hit, um, what we're presented with, it's a familiar UI to all VS developers, and it points precisely to where the address sanitizer error occurred. It's probably the range there, but I still don't have enough experience to, to know what the fix is. So uh, to investigate this further, I'll try to help get some help from someone more experienced than me in my team. And to do that, I'll just start a live share session directly from the uh, exception UI. A new session will start, and a link up for the session will be generated. I can share this link with anyone, regardless of where they are. All they need is an internet computer connected to the internet. Um, they don't need to replicate the environment I have here. They don't even need to have my sources locally on their boxes to help me out. For demonstration purposes, I'll just uh, uh, use another VS instance locally on my computer to connect. But remember, this could be uh, from any computer. What happens now is that this uh, session will start communicating with my session and load information to populate their UI. Solution Explorer, Editors, Auto Windows, Exception Dialog. Uh, now my teammate can review the exception info um, and that I was reviewing earlier. And they can look at the code and the call stack. Um, and um, I. I can see them navigating elsewhere in the code. Um, and they really have the freedom to navigate anywhere, to different files, open new windows. Um, but um, to keep track of where they're navigating, I, I, can, I can just lock in um, and, and keep an eye on, on the changes they're making. So as they look at the code, they realize that the faces, uh, that there are four faces recognized in this data set. Uh, but if they look at the eyes, um, there's, a, there's a problem uh, because uh, one of the faces have only one eye that has been recognized. And there's an implicit assumption in the code that there's either the zero eyes or uh, two. Uh, they realize uh, this error and they, they go and fix it right away. And you can see as they type in the editor, um, they get uh, IntelliSense from, from my project. Uh, the data is coming directly from my VS session uh, rather than their local IntelliSense. Now, after they're done with the fix, um, they leave the session um, because they have other more important things to do. But I am much happier because I understand uh, what the problem was. And while I was not very happy with the fix I got, I know that uh, it does address the, the test. Out of an uh, abundance of uh, enthusiasm uh, that we solved this, I will also throw in some uh, doc comments somewhere in this function. Um, and to do that, if I can navigate to the top, um, I'll use this new functionality in Visual Studio that allows me to create Doxygen comments. Just typing this will create a stop Doxygen comment. And I'll just say this draws faces. First parameter, uh, input image. The second parameter. And as I hover over the call to this function, and oh, I have to stop the debugger for that, um, the IntelliSense I am getting surfaces this uh, Doxygen information in a, in a nice way. Even, uh, even if parameter help, uh, I can see individual comments uh, for each of the parameters as I scroll by. This is a new feature that I recommend you to try. Uh, to turn it on, you do have to go to Tools Options um, and uh, change the default XML doc comments to any of the Doxygen options. And again, um, the way this comment was, uh, was uh, generated was based on the definition of that function. So this is a very helpful way uh, of generating Doxygen comments rather than writing them by hand. Now I'm feeling very confident about these changes. Uh, and I'll go ahead and prepare a commit. 
And I'll do that from the new Git Changes tab in Visual Studio. This is a new UI that is dedicated to all of the Git operations inside Visual Studio. And in the past, this used to be spread across multiple UIs, but now you can use this UI as a central command for Git. So if I want, I can quickly review the changes I made. Uh, I can right-click and compare. Um, and these changes look good, my comments and the actual fix. So I think we're ready to do and uh, stage this. Um, all we need to do is add another comment, say uh, bug fix for unit test, and I'm ready to commit. This gets committed uh, locally, but once I do, I can also have the option to push these changes uh, to the origin. And the origin in this case um, is my branch on our team's GitHub repo. So when I go there via this link, I can uh, create a new PR request to integrate these changes in master. We'll pass on that uh, for this demo since it requires some merging. But what I do want to show you is what happens when my changes were, were pushed to GitHub. Uh, what happened is that a GitHub action got kicked off automatically, and now there are two builds that have started, one for Windows and one for Linux. This is how our build is configured, and if you want, you can do the same. Uh, it's, it's very easy to get started. Just uh, uh, click uh, New Workflow, and GitHub will uh, direct you through a series of steps. In our case here, it already detected that this is a C++ repository, and it offers two starting templates, either a CMake or a Make one. And there's, of course, other starting points as well. Um, we could continue looking at uh, the CI output, uh, but I just got this IM uh, that someone uh, from our team has found a crash in our program, and they saved a core dump uh, for it, me to investigate. Now, this is problematic for me because this is a Linux core dump from Ubuntu, and I am on a Windows machine. Uh, what I might have to do is uh, to debug this is to move to a new machine, an Ubuntu machine, and create a new dev environment there. That's not something I'm very comfortable doing. I also would need to build all of my dependencies from scratch in order to have symbol information to debug this core dump, and that is a problem too, because this can take a few hours. Luckily, I can do something better than that. First, I can use the Windows subsystem for Linux to set up a Linux environment right on my Windows box. Secondly, I will use VC package to acquire my dependencies. And because now with VC package, I can take advantage of binary caching and manifests, this will significantly speed up the process. So let me really quickly save this link. Um, and, uh, and rather than uh, doing this in a few hours, um, let's do it in the next five minutes. So let me show you how uh, VC package manifest um, we're, uh, we're using uh, for this project. Uh, I'm not familiar what libraries uh, I will have to install on WSL, but luckily, all I have to do is use this manifest file that is checked in by my team together with the sources. So let's go and create this uh, new WSL configuration in my project. I will go to uh, the CMake uh, settings and just click uh, plus, and let's look for WSL in this list. Um, as you can see, there are many options uh, where I can pick from. Um, and with this step, VS will know now how to connect to my WSL instance. Now there's one more step. Uh, this step is to enable VC package binary caching, and I'll use this same two environment variables were used for Windows as well, and I'll paste them in the WSL configuration. We'll, uh, we'll come back to these two variables, but for now, uh, let's just get this uh, build and configuration going because even with binary caching, there will be some good megabytes to download. So let's switch to this uh, new configuration now. Everything seems to be in order, and we'll get the build, the configuration going, and um, as you can see uh, from uh, the output window, let me just uh, pin it here. Um, it's uh, you can see that VC package was automatically invoked during the CMA configuration step, and it has already identified the dependencies that need to be installed. Rather than uh, starting building from source, VC package will attempt to fetch uh, this from NuGet per the configuration we did earlier. 
And while these packages are being downloaded, let me show you one more step uh, you will need to do uh, to configure NuGet on your Linux machine. Uh, the binary sources environment variable um, is referencing a, a NuGet source called my GitHub packages uh, that I had to set up. And let me show you how I did that. I'm Right here, I'm using Windows Terminal, which is an awesome app. And I'm going to go to the VC package installation and run uh, VC package fetch NuGet, which will tell me uh, where NuGet is installed and install it in case it's missing. And then if I just run mono NuGet sources list, you will see that I already have this uh, NuGet package source uh, specified in NuGet. The command I run uh, to get it added here is NuGet sources uh, add. Um, and then uh, I can specify the, the source, I can specify my username and my password. Uh, but I've just done that before the demo uh, to save you the trouble from seeing my GitHub token uh, that I created for this demo. Uh, but this is a step you'll have to do as well. And while this download is still going on, let me also show you where these packages are coming from. Um, so if I go to packages uh, in, in GitHub, uh, you can see all of the packages that my team is sharing. Let's go to packages. And all of these packages uh, get uploaded here, um, either from CI builds or from local builds uh, that are done by my team. And, um, and the whole team benefits from reusing this, uh, this cached binaries. You can use the same location for both Windows and Linux or any other VC package triplets that you need. Uh, and you can use packages for both uh, your personal projects and as part of your organization. Feel free to try this functionality and we'll have detailed instructions on how to do that on our blog post today. So let's switch back to VS uh, to see how the download is going. So we can see now that the packages were downloaded and unpacked and it is around 800 megabytes of data that just got downloaded. And now CMake is configuring um, its environment for the first time on WSL. And you can see that it uh, hopefully is going to correctly identify the libraries that VC package uh, provided. Yeah, you can see protobuf. And as uh, CMake generation has completed, uh, is going to complete, well, all we have to do now is just uh, build the project. Um, this will use Ninja and the WSL Ubuntu environment. So this is all I have to do now to create an environment where I can uh, debug my project under Linux and also I can uh, debug the core dump that I, uh, that I just uh, received. Um, and to do that debugging of the core dump, um, what I'll have to do uh, is go to uh, debug, other debug targets, debug Linux core dump with native only. And while the build was going, uh, I unpacked the archive with the core dump, uh, and now it's available in my downloads folder. The program field points to the binary being debugged. And one last thing uh, I need to add is a property uh, that shows how to map sources between my Windows and my Linux environment. Now, I'm ready to debug uh, this uh, core dump. And um, for this core dump debugging to work, it is important that the symbols match across machines. Uh, that's something that uh, we take uh, very seriously in our team by making sure that the build environment is isolated and always building against the same version of the OS binary. If you're not careful, symbols might uh, not match and your debugging experience will be significantly uh, degraded. In our case, the symbols do match and I can uh, take a look at the call stack. Um, I can uh, take a look at the code exactly, my user code, where the crash occurred, and I can look at some of the variables to see their inputs, and they all seem uh, valid. Um, and uh, while looking for a crash, oh, so as you can see, the output uh, is trying to write to dev null, which seems to be uh, the key to this crash. Uh, and now I have enough information to probably try repoing uh, locally uh, on my WSL machine as well. Uh, with that, this wraps up our demo, and we did cover a lot of ground. Uh, we talked about CMake semantic navigation, address sanitizer in the debugger, uh, live share, uh, VC package binary caching, manifest, Windows subsystem for Linux, and core dump debugging. With that, I want to thank you, and I'll turn it back to Sai. Great. Thanks very much, Marion. OK, so that was our last demo. I'm now going to blitz through the rest of these slides because we don't have much time left. 
Um, so next, but one thing which we've been working hard on, as you've seen, is CMake integration. For a while, CMake has been a first-class project system in Visual Studio. It's not like something that we just bolted on. We really want to focus on CMake being a core part of the IDE experience. And that includes things like having Clang Tidy, squiggles and integrations right in the IDE, Doxygen, targeting any platform which you would like to target. As well as CMake integration, more broadly, we've been um, focusing on Linux targeting. And that's any distribution, whether it's a remote Linux installation or you're targeting WSL or it's an embedded device, we want you to be able to, to support these. And this includes things like MS build or CMake support and um, IntelliSense parsing through GCC. As for what's new in uh, the most recent version, we've been focusing on uh, making the CMake experience as rich as possible. As you've seen, we've had go to definition, find all references support in CMake list so that it's just a lot easier to navigate around your code. And then CMake project manipulation. So you don't have to like change a file name and then change your CMake list. That's just another thing you can get wrong. So we do that for you. Then there's a bunch of like small quality of life updates to Linux, like you saw the core dump debugging, first class support for GDB server and Ninja and all these things. If you'd like to learn more about those in particular, Erica has a talk on Wednesday, which you can go watch. So moving on to the last part of our talk, um, which is developer and team productivity. Build time improvements have been a real focus of ours. In C++, build times can be such a bottleneck for development, especially if you need fast iteration times, like if you're working in game dev or something like that. So in 16.6, so a few updates ago, we optimized our symbol lookup, gave much better debugging performance. Last update, 16.7, we improved a lot of the PDB creation and another number of other optimizations to give you between about 1.5 and 5.5 times speed up. Now we've been doing even more on PDB creation, parallelizing across multiple cores. So you should hopefully see around two times better um, link times on large projects. We'd really love to get more data on this. So please, um, if you are upgrade and can share your numbers with us, we'd love to hear that, especially if you're not getting the, um, the link time upgrades, which you think you should be getting. Uh, we'd really love to fix that. Um, so of course, one big problem about improving your build times is how do you know what your build time problems are? And that's why we introduced C++ Build Insights, which is a way of analyzing your builds. Um, so this is a, a product called VCPerf, which allows you to collect traces and then to visualize these traces, either with Windows Performance Analyzer or now in Edge or Chrome. Uh, this last feature was contributed by Carlos Fuagras, um, and this is because we made VCPerf open source last year. So um, thank you so much for that um, addition to our tools. Please have a look at how you could adapt VCPerf for your own use cases and think about um, if there's anything which you could contribute back or which would help people in your industry have a chat to us, come stop by our booth. Runtime performance is next. Runtime performance is, of course, why we use um, C++ in the first place. And uh, Marion, I think we're, you're on the live share slide. Can we go back to the runtime performance slide? Not the build insights one, the runtime performance. Oh, you're missing a slide. OK, well, imagine that there's, oh, there we go. There's, yes, runtime performance. So of course, we use C++ for the runtime performance, and we're continuing to work on this. Our latest optimization is called jump threading. The idea of that being if you have a number of different jumps in the code, which are all following the same path every time, then you can optimize out those intermediate jumps and go straight to the end. Um, so that's something we've implemented recently. Some other examples are memset code gen and optimizing better around intrinsics. If you use a lot of intrinsics in your code, see if you get some improvements. Um, we also, if you use the um, AVX 512 uh, flag, then we have better auto vectorization enabled. So please give that a try, see how your code gen is affected. Um, next, live share. Live share we introduced a couple of years ago, so I won't spend much time on that, but it's a collaborative editing and debugging tool for working within your team, no matter where you are, to do pro pair programming, group programming, whatever you like. And on the subject of collaborative tools, we're working a lot on GitHub code spaces, which is supposed to be an instant dev environment where no matter where you are, you can just uh, press a button and immediately have a code editor up to work on your program. 
this can free up resources on your machine. You know, if it has, um, if it's a very resource intensive uh, project, it can also make it very easy to onboard new contributors. You know, if someone just wants to um, give a few patches, then it's way easier to get started if you don't have to spend ages getting your dev environment set up. So if you want to hear more about code spaces, please go check out Nick's talk on Wednesday. Um, so to reiterate, the mission of the C++ product team went to make the lives of all C++ developers better by participating in the standard, um, investing in all our tools, MSVC, VC package, Visual Studio, BS code. And part of doing that is listening to all of you folks. Um, developer community is our main way of doing, well, one of the main ways we do that, and people creating their own suggestions and voting on them, and that helps us prioritize issues. So these are just a few of the, um, the suggestions which have come in from all of you and that you've voted on and then we've implemented. You know, we talked about C11 support, uh, we added library support to Compiler Explorer through VC package, address sanitizer, we've talked about a lot, um, a UTF-8 runtime, something that a lot of people were asking for, and we prioritize based on that. So please keep on voting. Please keep on submitting your suggestions. And with that, thank you very much for listening. And um, before we finish off, I'd like to remind you to please come talk to us at our booth and um, in our exhibitor room uh, to please take our survey to you know get that flight simulator win. And then please also uh, have a look at all of our other sessions, which we have. We have 10 sessions at CPPCon this year um, on a variety of subjects. I have another two talks I'm giving, which is a really silly idea, but um, we'll see how it goes. So thank you very much. Um, apparently, we can go a little bit longer. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please drop them in the, the chat or the Q&A and uh, you know, we're on like a, a 20 second um, timeout from you folks. So I'm just going to waffle for, for 20 seconds. I can tell you about um, my, my other talks. I have one tomorrow about the mathematics behind um, a lot of the structures you use in your code, which should be good. And uh, please do go to Julia's talk next. It should be really great. Um, on collaborative development with Visual Studio Code. We have some very exciting um, announcements in that talk as well. And some very um, cool demos. Yes, yeah, some very cool demos. And um, yes, yeah, Sunny's talk on static analysis. Uh, you know, there's a lot of buzz in the community about Rust and C++. And how do you like uh, look at the differences in safety and things like that? So we're going to talk about bridging that gap a bit. Um, and then Stefan's talks are always great. Uh, hearing about our uh, C++ 20 features in our STL, always fun. Um, then I have another talk on dynamic polymorphism, which is essentially like recreating Rust traits, but with experimental metaprogramming facilities. Uh, then we have Erica and Nick talking about cross-platform and code spaces. Then our, our talk on Friday on our new uh, open source fuzzing platform, which I don't really know much about. So I'm, I'm definitely going to go to that talk. It should be interesting. And uh, I'm not seeing any, um, any yeah, questions in chat. But I see some claps. Uh, yeah, so claps are always nice. Thank you for claps. Um, also, thank you so much to our wonderful volunteers for uh, helping resolve our, our technical difficulties. It turns out that giving a, a virtual talk where you're all like on completely different sides of the world is kind of kind of difficult. So thank you so much to Alessandro and Mia for that. All right. If there are no other questions, then we can call it a wrap. Well, I think I think chat is just getting to the point where I asked for questions. This is the I did it's, <laughs> I trouble to work out like where everyone else is in the talk which we just gave. Um, okay. but yeah, I think this is around where I called for questions. So if, if people have questions, um, then please come and talk to us at the booth is probably best or just, you know, uh, catch us in the, the hallway track. We're always, um, always love to talk to people. So thank you very much. Thank you.